Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the DGAP Morning Briefing. I'm Henning Hoff, Executive Editor of Internationale Politik Quarterly. Russia's war against Ukraine ended since nine, sorry, its 491st day. The most remarkable development over, of recent days was, of course, the attempted coup by Yevgeny Prigozhin last weekend, which was aptly covered by our DGAP colleagues Stefan Meister and Andra Shah in a special briefing on Tuesday. Today, we want to look ahead to an event Germany hasn't seen in 23 years. On Sunday, French President Emmanuel Macron arrives in Stuttgart for a state visit together with his wife, Brigitte. On Monday morning, he will be officially welcomed by a formation of the Franco-German Brigade in Ludwigsburg, the place where Charles de Gaulle held a famous speech addressed to the German youth in 1962, held uh, speaking in German and calling for the younger generation to overcome the view of a traditional enmity between France and Germany. Macron will then travel on to Berlin for a state banquet at Schloss Bellevue and a boat trip with Chancellor Olaf Scholz before concluding his visit in Dresden on Tuesday. This all promises to provide a lot of sunlit pictures, but how good or bad is the the Franco-German relationship really? And what does this rare state visit signify, the first since Jacques Chirac visited in the year 2000? To take the Franco-German temperature, as it were, I have the great pleasure of welcoming an excellent panel consisting of Michaela Wiegel, who has been Paris correspondent for Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung since 1998. Inter alia, she is the author of a highly praised book about Emmanuel Macron, and I would say one of the best experts on France and the Franco-German relationship. Welcome, Michaela Wiegel. Um, next, we have Rolf Nikola with us, Vice President of the German Council on Foreign Relations. He served as ambassador to Poland for eight years before he was voted into his present role with us. Less well known, perhaps, is that he studied at Sciences Po um, at a time when not many Germans did that, graduating in 1979. Also, uh, he, also he was exchange official or Austauschbeamter at the Quai d'Orsay in 1994 to 1996, after which he became deputy head of the political division of the German embassy in Paris. Later in his career, from 2005 to 2011, he was deputy foreign policy advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel, and in this role, he also dealt quite frequently with France. Welcome, Rolf Nikel. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, last but not least, we have with us Jakob Ross who is a research fellow at the Alfred von Appenheim Center for the Future of Europe here at the German Council of Foreign Relations, and our expert for France and the Franco-German relationship. Very good morning, Jakob. Good morning. Both Jakob and Michaela Wiegel have written insightful articles in the brand new issue of Internationale Politik. They are also available in English on the IBQ website, and I'll post the links in a moment. Before we start, some quick housekeeping rules. We are trying to make this format more interactive, and to start us off, I'll be putting questions to each panelist. After roughly 30 minutes, we will be opening up for your questions and comments. For the Q&A, please raise your hand, introduce yourself in person, uh, sorry, introduce yourself and put your question in person to the panel. You're also welcome to submit questions and comments via the chat function. And if you wonder why are the morning briefings in English, the event is being recorded and will be published later today to make the expertise of DJP and this panel available to an international audience as well. And with a word of thanks to Mila Nitsch and Jan Stöckmann, as well as to our colleagues at the events and communication teams, let's start with Michaela Wiegel. So what is the state of the Franco-German relationship? Well, let's um, start with good news this morning. Good morning, everybody. And please forgive me if my English is too rusty as you heard I lived for 25 years in France now, and um, I rarely use uh, the English language. So uh, please forgive me. Um, I think um, the French-German relationship is much better than it uh, seems sometimes. Um, And uh, what strikes me uh, mostly is that um, we always focus on the conflicting issues, but we forget very quickly um, the, the, the rapprochement, the, 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 how much um, France and Germany um, became closer the past years. And I just want to uh, mention some points. 
France is now again a full member of NATO, which is very important. Uh, seeing the actual um, geopolitical um, tensions. Um, and France is also no longer uh, opposed to um, EU and even NATO um, enlargement. This is a very, very important development. And I feel um, in Germany, it's not really recognized very often. Um, it's... Um, it's very important because um, it means that we are heading in the same direction. And I also believe that there's nothing new about the ongoing conflicts um, between France and Germany. What is new um, is the much more faster changing world around us. We are no longer surrounded by friends or friendly um, powers. We are really in a world um, quickly changing and not waiting for the French and the Germans um, to get their lessons done for Europe. Because as you know, it's still um, necessary that French and Germany um, get together to make uh, Europe um, develop. So I don't know if I should stop here and um, leave the floor to the others and come back to the points or... Um, do you want to hear more? My my note is really positive. I really think that the state with it um, can show that France and Germany belong together and that they should um, work together for the big issues. And I really think that probably um, in Germany, the older generation that was really focused on, on understanding France um, is slowly... Um, getting um, out of power and the new generation is less interested um, in what is the French thinking and is less, um, how to say, um, in touch with uh, why France acts differently. Just one concrete uh, We can't hear you right now. You've been the special. We'll switch off. Okay. Yeah, but I think we got your point though that that um, uh, on 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 general terms to think it's not as bad as as, as some press reports might suggest. Uh, there has been sort of when when the um, interministerial meeting was postponed uh, last October, um, and uh, or, or some commentary says so there there the Agro German ledger really is at the low point, as bad as as I don't know. Uh, Many, many decades ago, so you wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't subscribe to that view. It's not that bad. Well, in fact, um, it was a warning signal, of course. Um, it was a cry for more attention. I mean, um, we now know it's because An Annalena Baerbock cancelled um, her presence, uh, saying she she was about um, to go for a family holiday. And she couldn't um, change that to go to a French-German um, summit. Um, and there were obviously um, deeper uh, divergences on um, on especially the, the European Sky Shield initiative. But in any case, um, it was a signal, a very strong signal from France to say, please, Germany, um, take care of us. And... Um, well, it, it, it happened to be much better in January then. Thank you very much. Let's move on to Jakob. Um, what's your take? How good or bad is the relationship right now? Good, good morning again. Uh, thank you for, for turning in. And, and since uh, Michaela Wiegel took the, the optimistic stance, I will uh, be slightly more critical and, and say that um, I I've, firstly, I agree that there's nothing new about conflict the Franco-German relationship has always been conflictual, but at the moment, and again, Michaela Wiegel said so uh, as well, uh, there's just a feeling that there's so many questions that demand answers and there's very little time that uh, we really need uh, a good and healthy uh, Franco-German relationship. Now, I would say that um, the relationship is strong in terms of quantity at the moment, but less so in, in qualitative terms, and I will give a, a couple of examples. Um, 
look at the number of bilateral meetings and you will feel that the relationship is stronger than ever. There has been the Franco-German minister counts in January. There has been many bilateral meetings between certain uh, ministries, uh, especially so uh, with Annalena Baerbock uh, going to Paris, um, assisting in a cabinet meeting with um, her counterpart, Colonna, I think in May, uh, most recently, uh, President Macron already uh, was in Potsdam for a uh, tete a tete with, with Chancellor Scholz in, in June. Now he's coming, uh, obviously, for the state visit, for three-day state visit. But what's missing, to my sense at least, and that's what counts at the end, um, when you look at all these meetings, are the, the concrete results and the, the, the answers to pressing questions, as I said. Um, maybe to give four examples, I think that uh, in energy policy, um, there's still no clear answer between the two uh, countries, but also for the, the broader European Union um, on the question how we will manage not only next year, but, but in the coming 10 or 20 years, uh, the transition towards a green economy, what role nuclear power will play in that. Um, a second example would be defense policy. Obviously, as you said, Henning, the, the one Ukraine is still um, hovering above every other question uh, still now. Um, the question whether we want a more sovereign European Union or not is not answered and still creates a lot of conflict. We might come back to that in, in, in our conversation later. Uh, enlargement policy, I would agree with uh, Michaela Wiegel that there has been a, a, a crucial shift in French uh, diplomacy, that the French are much more open to enlargement uh, within the European Union, but also within NATO than they used to be uh, historically. But there's still no clear timetable for either Ukraine or the, the countries in the Western Balkans or the Republic of Moldova on when to join and on what conditions. And finally, uh, the reforms of the European Union and the big question if the Union is actually ready to take in all these these new member states and what is need to be done uh, to make it ready uh, in the coming years. Now, again, just to be clear and to context contextualize this, this criticism as well, um, I think that the fact that we are discussing all these different questions and searching for a common position between France and Germany is in itself an absolutely uh, remarkable historical achievement. But I think if we want to pursue this success in the 21st century, um, that there's a, 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 an increasing need to open a new chapter and maybe to close an old one, the Elysee chapter, uh, the one of reconciliation of the 20th century. And that's why I think, and, and I wrote in, in this recent memo as well, um, and I know that I'm not the only one thinking this. Many officials actually say so um, when you talk to them in, in private or under Chatham House rules, um, that there is this, this need for renewal. And I think that the state visit and Emmanuel Macron coming to Germany on, on Sunday um, is another opportunity um, to kind of open, open this new chapter and, and come up with concrete solutions to all these different questions. Thank you very much, Jakob. Um, well or quick take on, on this relationship. Merci de m'avoir convié à cette discussion. And now I'll continue in English. Um, I think I would come down uh, listening to the two speakers before, more on the side uh, of Michaela Wiegel. The France-French-German relationship is and will remain for the foreseeable future Germany's most important relationship. This is the strongest bilateral relationship Germany has with, with anyone in the world. Uh, there's a strong basis uh, in civil society and in business ties, use exchange and all these things in it, indispensable for EU integration. And the famous reflex Franco-Allemand works very well. What is the reflex Franco-Allemand? Both countries generally, when there are new problems, uh, tend to come down on opposite sides of the problem. But the important thing then is, and it, which, is, which distinguishes this relationship from others, is that civil so servants and others come together and work out compromises. And these compromises generally stand because Germany and France in the European Union 
have an indispensable role. And if they come together, that's already pretty much an important an important thing. And um, uh, the difference now, and again, I would I would agree with the previous speakers, is that we are now in a totally different international ball game with a with a different uh, crisis and challenges that we face, and we still haven't found the right answers on on all sides. That concerns Germany, that concerns uh, France, and that concerns all the others. We also have internal challenges. Of course, uh, Germany uh, uh, with the with the government, three parties, and the kind all the kind of problems that we that we encounter on on different issues. And uh, the France and French President uh, Macron is also challenged uh, in his own in his own country. We've seen this uh, recently very very open very uh, openly. So uh, what I think is necessary at this stage is that. Uh, fundamentally change international situation, if you wish, needs a new commitment to the relationship. And this commitment also needs to be emotional. It's not only enough uh, to, to say, yeah, okay, we're working on these issues, but we need, to, we need to portray a new vision of our bilateral relationship and of our, and of our European uh, relationship. And it's clear, very clear to me that for, for Europe, of course, we have had this uh, vision of uh, peace, uh, everlasting peace. We have the vision of economic prosperity. All this is more or less uh, done. There is nobody thinks about a, a conflict within the countries of the European Union. And, and we have this, uh, really achieved, if you look at the, at the different decades, uh, uh, in remarkable uh, uh, economic prosperity. Um, but we, what we need to do now is to define the relationship or what we need to define how Europe can actually protect us against all these challenges that come from the outside. And there, of course, again, <laughs> we have different viewpoints uh, in, in, in France and in, and in Germany. But that's, the, that's actually, I think, the issue. And that's, I think, where the visit of state uh, of uh, President Macron will play a very important role. I'll keep it at that, at that at that stage. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, um, well, Michael also just said sort of an uh, owner is missing, maybe. And uh, you wrote in that that uh, in, in Germany uh, a few years ago, you should bang the Germans saying you should remember that France loves you. And and that uh, 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 he will without moves, uh, so so in in his way a little emotionally involved. Uh, and so, how could you would you describe this this um, commitment on the track maybe, or or is it is it some is is uh, sort of noticeable on both sides? Maybe you can comment a little bit. I'm not sure I um, was able to listen to everything you said because um, my connection was really bad. Um, but as far as I understood, um, you you asked me if uh, if um, the French German relationship needs more emotions and more um, and more um, signs of kind of mutual interest. Is that your question? Uh, did I understand you right? I can't hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, I think um, during his speech in um, the uh, um, um, in in January at the Sorbonne University, um, Chancellor o Olaf Scholz said uh, we don't need sweet talk um, between France and Germany. I think he's mistaken because obviously we have to talk uh, very seriously about the hard facts about about defense, about about the conditions for an enlargement, everything like that. But you still need, and even more so as the young generation thinks that reconciliation is accomplished, you really need something to show to the younger generations why we have to work together. And I feel that uh, for a lot of um, young people, um, while well, France is too too um, nearby, it's not very um, 
exciting to go to France you, when you can travel everywhere in the world and when you can discover um, other cultures. So you really need to create interest. And we see it um, if we look at um, at the, um, the, the, the language um, uh, numbers um, in both countries, um, the, the young people don't want to learn the other language because they think with English they can um, obviously um, uh, communicate. And, and there is a very parallel movement for young German, um, uh, young Germans and young French uh, to learn English and Spanish. Um, but that means that somehow a part of um, the other culture um, is not understood. And, um, and I think it's a very dangerous um, development because you always need people not only um, can communicate in another language with, with each other, but to understand what happens in a country, why things um, are done the way they are done. And that's why I really believe you need to have um, some emotional mo uh, moments. We had a very emotional moment um, in Paris this week when Angela Merkel, who was, and you never have to forget this, very much criticized at some points in France. It was not always um, a, a very harmonious relationship. But then again, all living former presidents came to, um, to, to, to tell her how much she did for Europe. And I think this is a really good outcome to see that um, in the end, we, um, we, we see that there was always a struggle, but we always found a compromise. So I really believe that we should have some signs of friendship and the boat tour is probably a good idea um, because it means um, kind of symbolically um, we are in the same boat and that's exactly what what's the real thing. Thank you very much. Um, Jakob, um, I mean, if you look at the, the disagreements um, uh, most recently, have, have often touched on, on questions of, of, um, of uh, rearmament, of, 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 of also, also so the, the strategy attached to it. Um, would it be right to say that, that one of the big underlying problems right now is this, this, uh, um, the fact that, that, that Germany and France uh, have, have huge disagreements on, on, the, on the strategic side? That um, where in the, the 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 previous years it was was it clear that France was leading strategically and and Germany maybe more economically, and now we have this sort of this competition between Paris and Berlin, um, sort of who's in the lead um, and and who's sort of uh, uh, pushing pushing Europe in, in in which direction? Is that true? Be before uh, answering that, just a small comment on what was said by um, Michaela Riegel and and Rolf Nicke previously. Because I absolutely agree that um, this this emotional uh, side, these signs of appreciations, are really crucial. And uh, again, I listening to um, Chancellor Merkel's speech at, at Sciences Po as well, when she said that the soul of of the European integration process uh, was its diversity, and the soul of the European continent really was its diversity in terms of language and culture. Um, I would absolutely agree that that. Um, I mean, language skills are at the very basis uh, of, of the Franco-German relationship. And again, we, we uh, apologize for speaking English today, but I think um, it, it's absolutely crucial that in the going forward, there is still young people learning the language of the partner countries. If they don't, I think we will, we will have a problem in, in a decade or two uh, from here. Now, um, coming to your question on, on this change of leadership, I mean, Maybe both both countries are switching sides at the moment. Um, maybe uh, Germany uh, uh, is is leaving the economic leadership to France because the country is going into re recession. And um, as was recently written, is the only big economy within the European Union that has not returned to pre-COVID GDP levels. Uh, while France is is doing a uh, pretty good, the debt issue uh, kept aside. But jokes aside, I think yes that. There is a feeling in, in Paris that Germany is challenging th this ancient uh, status of, of leadership, um, um, the, the strategic uh, leadership of, of France in the defense uh, sector. Um, I think that 
many people in, in France appreciate this, actually, and appreciated this when Chancellor Scholz first announced the Zeitenwende, uh, the 100 billion um, um, Sondervermögen, no extra fund for, for defense spending. Um, but necessarily, there will be um, people who are, who are frightened or who are questioning what, what this money will be spent on. And what I see in Paris at the moment, and I'm curious if this will be a topic uh, much discussed uh, throughout the state visit, is that many in the French government, but also in French politics, uh, in the opposition, but also in Macron's party, are starting to question if the German Zeitenwende is actually something that will be good for the Franco-German relationship and for the European Union as France understands it. Because People, um, starting from uh, Chancellor Scholz's uh, speech in, in, in Prague, his, his big Europe speech, um, when afterwards he announced the Skysheet Initiative, so the first structuring German um, uh, defense project, uh, people in Paris got the feeling that he was talking a lot about middle Europa or middle Europe, um, the fact that Germany was, was looking eastwards uh, increasingly. And um, that would be something where France would see the necessity as a reaction to the war in Ukraine, but would not necessarily uh, feel in, uh, included. Um, and so I think that's something that where the German government really needs to 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 communicate more and, and to signal to the French um, that German Zeitenwende does not put into question the old and, and very functional uh, Franco-German relationship. Um, and I think maybe just one last point to illustrate this a concrete example uh, that the defense procurements that the German government has decided on, starting with the F-35 fighter jets, uh, Chinook uh, helicopters, and now the, the missile defense systems, uh, Patriot from the US, Arrow from, from Israel or Israel and the US, are really interpreted in France as Germany um, kind of stepping down on its commitments on European sovereignty. Uh, I mean, on the official side, um, European sovereignty is still a goal of the current German government. It figures in the coalition treaty. It figured in Chancellor uh, Scholz's uh, Zeitenwende speech. It now figures in the new uh, national security strategy. But in actual fact, if you look at the procurement decisions, for, for instance, the French are not really seeing a strengthening of, of European sovereignty, quite on the contrary. And so I think there's, there's a big danger that we have this, this growing gap between official discourse and what we see in, in, in the actual uh, action being taken by the government and a growing danger as well for President Macron uh, internally because um, the opposition on both extremes, the far left and far right, are really starting to attack him on the fact that these Franco-German and European projects are not making uh, much progress at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf Nickel. Um, a, a quick question about about the the the, um, the relationship between Macron and Scholz. They're sort of temperamentally they are, they are quite 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 different. Um, but um, maybe that's also always been been the case. Or maybe could you give us a, a bit of a historical perspective whether this particular incarnation of the um, couple um, um, uh, Franco Allemand is 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 is, is different uh, fundamentally from from previous incarnations. Not really, I would I would say uh, there have always uh, been challenges uh, in the relationship, and they have generally been exaggerated by some quarters of uh, public opinion, uh, and that concerned the level of uh, on the level of personalities on on the way certain people uh, act, uh, their how they are, uh, on the level of uh, different structures. And on the on the level of the challenges that we face at a specific moment, uh, let me let me let me give you one example: of the level of personalities. Generally, on the level of personalities, generally there's always that we have different election calendars. So there's always somebody who's who's junior and the other one is senior, and so all everybody also always has to adjust somehow uh, to uh, to the other, and. Uh, for for example, the relationship with uh, Chirac and and uh, and Schroeder was was very indicative in this moment. In the beginning, uh, Chirac, I was preparing meetings when uh, when they were together, and Schroeder felt physically uneasy when he was with Chirac. From a from a point of personality, he studied files, which was very unusual for Schroeder, and and then and then suddenly. Uh, the Iraq war came up 
and Schroeder and 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 Chirac uh, suddenly realized how important it was to stick together, and they were the closest friends ever. So so this this kind of this kind of a relationship you see with practically all so-called couples uh, uh, in in the Franco-German relationship. Uh, Pompidou was 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 very worried about uh, about politik yeah uh, Merkel and Sarkozy had had real problems in the beginning and and in the end uh, the international situation the international framework led to the fact that they had to work together and they worked very well together so so on the, this is on the level of the of the personalities on the level of structures of course we have to realize that that we have totally two totally different uh, political systems there's a uh, there's a presidential system in France where the French president has a lot of uh, freedom and a lot of liberty to do things, whereas the German chancellor is always dependent on his majority in the Bundestag. Yeah, so uh, so that that makes that makes them makes it difficult for them to to uh, maintain uh, or at least for one one of them makes it difficult to ma- maintain support uh, for his foreign policy. Also in in Germany, we generally have coalition governments, um, which means a longer decision process. And uh, and 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 Germany generally, more generally, is a consensus democracy. Whereas Germany in, in France, uh, sometimes it's uh, it's a, it's a conflict democracy uh, when when decisions are taken uh, quickly, uh, but m- not not necessarily with the consultation of everybody. And there's a uh, there's a third ele- structural element which is important, I think, and that is Karl's rule. Yeah, the French don't understand um, the rule uh, or the, the the importance of the constitutional court in in Germany. They sometimes think uh, that that Germany is hiding behind this. It's all it's different structures, different traditions that contribute to sometimes uh, misunderstandings. But the most the most important point now, I think, is that the, the situation in Europe is, is so different. Um, and it, it shows very clearly that Germany and France, uh, Fr- oh, Germany and France, the French cooperation is, is necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for progress in Europe, which means that we have to somehow deal with the Eastern flank. And, and in, the, in the, the past, uh, the French attitude vis-a-vis, uh, vis-a-vis the Eastern flank was uh, somehow somehow quite uh, uh, quite difficult. Now, in in a speech in uh, in Bratislava, um, Macron has come uh, come out uh, against uh, against this tradition, and so they're they're moving in the, into into the right direction. And thirdly, on the on the level of, of problems, if you look at the most important uh, uh, problems or challenges that we have at the moment, which is the the Russia war. Which is uh, which is uh, how we behave vis-à-vis China, uh, uh, climate change, um, and and migration issue. We, you see a large uh, the convergence of, of points. So we we already see that this new very new situation has led to 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 a new appreciation of the problems and to moving together of France uh, of France and Germany. And that is something I think that we will see uh, that we will see even more. As we as we move towards uh, towards that new uh, security architecture in the transit uh, in uh, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are past the thirty minute mark, so so let's let's open up for for questions and comments. We've got three hands up, which is really good. Um, please introduce yourself very shortly and then put your question or comment. Um, we start with Tom O'Donnell. Oh. Tom O'Donnell, I can't spell this thing. I'm, I'm afraid the connection is really bad. Uh, I, I hear you. Yeah, it's, uh, um, um, maybe uh, where you could you maybe maybe uh, log off and on again, and then then um, uh, we, we take a question. Um, uh, let's move on to Delphine. Um, now, would you please? And pre- yes, hello. I hope the connection is better. Yes. Okay. So I'm working for the French newspaper La Croix. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one uh, I would like to ask to Mr. Ross. You said that the French-German common projects uh, in in the defense field do not really progress. Uh, do you think that the Chancellor Scholz should put more pressure on the German defense industry to move the 
the SCAF project forward more quickly? Does he have the ability, the possibility to do it? Isn't there here a difference between France and Germany and Macron and Scholz? And, uh, uh, do you think that the government should maybe be more proactive on this uh, issue? And the second uh, question um, concerns the uh, Sky uh, Missile Defense Shield. I don't know how you say it in English, but um, is there here not a, a simple problem of timing between France and Germany that uh, uh, German, Germany needs something very quickly now and does not have the time to wait for the French-Italian proposal to be implemented? Or is it uh, too simple to analyze it like that? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, while Jakob is, is, is thinking about his answer, let's also hear from Peter Linke. So we've got another question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the input. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, concerning space. So what is the uh, actual um, state of affairs in uh, space cooperation between France and Germany? We had the agreement on uh, the launcher business uh, from November last year. What has happened since then? Uh, the, the, the trilateral um, uh, agreement between Italy, uh, France and, and Germany. And the second, the second question um, is, um, um, or my second question is about the uh, French attitude or French discussions around uh, the Artemis uh, Moon project of the Americans. So what's the what's the what's the debate? What's the the, uh, the main direction of the debate? Thank you very much. Very specific questions, but um, maybe maybe Michaela Nickel can can shed a light on that. Oh. But let's start with uh, with Jakobos on the Sky Shield initiative and and the German German uh, arms industry. Yeah, well, on on these uh, arms projects, and I think you basically gave the answer um, at the second half of your question. Um, I don't think that the Chancellor has the same uh, possibilities to intervene and to exert pressure upon industrials uh, in in Germany as as President Macron can do in France. Um, I mean, the, the French arms industry is, is so intertwined with the political elites, with the administration. Um, many of the, the people uh, running um, places like Dassault or the big uh, arms industry firms uh, w went to, to ENA, to the, to the big schools, Sciences Po, with, with the same people who are now running uh, politics, uh, who are running the country. So it's very much the same elite. These people change posts from one to another. Um, uh, Dassault uh, in France is 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 writing op-eds um, um, at a very um, high rhythm. He exerts influence on on groups in in Parliament. So there's a very strong link, and I don't think that exists uh, so much in in Germany. Um, I mean, the the German industry is very keen that uh, politics uh, are to be kept outside. That there's not as much pressure at, as there is uh, probably in France. Um, I think this really applies uh, even more to the um, uh, main ground combat vehicles so the ground system france and germany are developing then uh, to to the uh, to the uh, plane the fighter plane um, because you can see very well that that rheinmetall one of the german partners in this uh, specific project is really not um, too keen to to do what um, uh, what what the politics are, are demanding that rheinmetall and kmw the two german competitors uh, are having infights uh, on the German side. So, I mean, to put it briefly, no, I don't think that uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, can exert as much pressure as some would, would uh, hope uh, he could. And very briefly on, on the Skysheet initiatives, um, I, uh, sorry, no, I for forgot the specific question uh, while, while talking or while answering the first one. Um, the if it's a question of timing, that's a Germany. Ah, yes. Equipment. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, absolutely. I think it is because this off the shelf uh, procurement strategy on the German side is, I mean, you can understand it uh, since uh, uh, the, the Sondervermögen has to be spent now. Um, the money is there now. The political consensus on spending this money is there now. And who knows what the political landscape will look like uh, after the next general elections in Germany and if this, this money will be still on the table, actually. Um, but I think the, the problem is that the French are less and less um, trusting 
the German side, um, when the German side says, okay, on the, on the short term, we might buy extra European, but in the long run, we keep committed to European, uh, to the strengthening of, of, of the European industrial base. I think that in France, there's a growing feeling that this is just discourse and that actually there has been a huge shift away from strengthening European sovereignty, the European industrial base. Um, within the German government. And I think that uh, bills like the one Pistorius um, introduced in, in April or May, uh, which basically said going forward, we will prioritize uh, time, timely availability, so off-the-shelf buying, and then avoid complicated political uh, nitty-nitty uh, decision-making, which is absolutely characteristic of Franco-German or European uh, Defense Corporation, uh, was perceived as a very big threat to this this goal of European sovereignty in Paris. Sorry for being long. That's all right, no problem. Um, Michael Levige, can you shed any light on, on the space question? Yeah, uh, let me first please uh, strike a more uh, pessimistic note on um, the European Skyship Initiative. I really believe it's not about timing, and I really believe it's about a very solitary uh, political move in Germany not consulting the French and um, discovering in a kind of panic mo moment um, that we don't have invested, that we have underinvested for, 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 for really a long time in air defense and now telling everybody we need something without, without consulting our most important allies, meaning France and even Poland, and then realizing that it will be very expensive to build a sky shield, say, well, let's make a European initiative out of it. And this is the beginning of the European Sky Shield Initiative and is the beginning also about the French um, uh, attitude of being irritated. And I really think the French have a point and I don't understand why Germany is not seeing it, um, that we don't start with a um, a big uh, geostrategical debate on what is happening in Russia. We were completely um, ignoring when the Americans um, went out of um, the last treaty. The German government um, was um, uh, under the big coalition, the grand coalition, uh, didn't even want to discuss when the French always said, we can't let that happen and not being uh, protected. So I really believe that Germany has to um, realize that this was a really bad move and that they really have to get the act together to get France into it. And um, as we saw um, during the last visit by um, by Defense Minister Pistorius in Paris, uh, this uh, topic is not over. And I really think also what Jakob just said, that um, all the decision-making um, about the F-35 uh, fighter jets, about what is um what is bored you can always say we need um we we need what is on shelf but in any case if you don't answer the question why do you buy american and do you know that this means we will be for for um at least 30 40 years dependent on american decision making because we don't get the black box um i think then we we really um and this is, I come to the space question. I'm not an expert of, of space, but I just had an interview with the ESAR um, uh, director. So I think um, it's interesting to see that the same problems we have in the defense sector are, um, you can observe them in the space sector, that Germany is taking, is in a decision taking process, telling that the coalition process is so complicated that they, have to figure out for themselves and just afterwards they will consult with the French. And the French are increasingly thinking that um, that Germany uh, wants rather to invest in American-made um, uh, uh, technology than to push for European pro pro projects. And this is clearly, there are problems with uh, Ariane, um, but this is clearly um, also a problem that the Germans always come up with this um, with this argument, we can't wait, and therefore um, get more and more into American dependency. This might be a good strategy, but we don't know what is happening um, in, in Washington um, 
over the next or even the the next election. Thank you very much. And before we go back to the questions uh, of people who haven't raised their hands, there's one question by Sylvie Kaufmann, uh, which I would like to, to put to Rolf Nickel. Or maybe, Sylvie, you want to put it in person? And um, it is, uh, it's, uh, she's asking about the role you see uh, for, 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 for Poland in the Franco German relationship. It's, it's sort of, how, how does this, is, is, is the Weimar Triangle really a thing? Or, or sort of, how does Poland fit in? Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvie, for that for that question. Um, uh, I think the the Poland w would be an important partner in steering ahead uh, on the European uh, on the European issues. The problem right now is uh, that we are in an election cycle in Poland. There will be parliament very important parliamentary elections uh, in the uh, in, on October fifteenth, probably. Uh, and the Polish government has decided to conduct the election campaign on uh, criticizing very heavily, first of all, Germany, but also being very skeptical on the on some of the most important issues within the European Union. So I would say uh, up until the election, uh, till the end of the year, is probably not much to be done in this, in this triangular relationship. But afterwards, I think it would be very important Uh, to integrate uh, Poland into into this European uh, vision and in this European decision making process as well, the Weimar Triangle, I think, is a good uh, is a good thing. It needs uh, commitment on all sides. Well, uh, quite a, quite sometimes we didn't have much commitment on the French side after the after the helicopter deal. Uh, but now, but now we need the commitment on the Polish side. And the commitment on the Polish side means. Uh, stopping this, uh, what I would call a power struggle on the eastern flank, uh, where they where they're trying to to reduce the German role and the French rule, um, uh, the French uh, uh, influence in the European Union as a whole. Um, so uh, I'm in the short run, I'm not I'm not very optimistic, but in the longer run, maybe we should be more optimistic. Um, we're going um, now to Ninon Renan. The north. Sorry. Uh, yes. Good morning. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm 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 correspondent for Ezeco in Berlin, in Germany, and so and um, I I wanted to ask you uh, perhaps a more concrete question about this visit from Macron. Uh, there's a tradition in France for this speech, and and Macron is uh, an, well known for that. So. What do you expect from his speech on, on Tuesday in Dresden? And, and may, can it make a, uh, uh, um, uh, an important change? Can, can can it can it can it be uh, uh, decisive for 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 this relation? Thank you very much. Um, next one is uh, Hans Jürgen Heimsel. You are still muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Well, I'll be having been with Rolf at Sciences Po and following France not as closely, but also I uh, find this is a bit too cuddling uh, with the situation. I see the positive things uh, Michaela Wiegel pointed out and Rolf, uh, and we can say, well, they will come together earlier or later, but we don't live in normal times. Uh, we really had the Zeitenwende turning point and the picture France and Germany gave in these times really were not good. A uh, few hours before, before France and I know United States and Germany announced the murder and Bradley deal, uh, Macron had to step in with AFX. So the whole defense uh, industry question is there. I didn't hear anything about China. It's a bit sort of uh, was a picture of business as usual. And I think we really are not in times where we can allow ourselves also in the German-French relations business as usual. Uh, and my question would be, what would you recommend um, that this might go better uh, next time we have crisis like after uh, the starting of the war? Uh, that uh, maybe the French uh, president understands a bit better how Germany ticks, why United States was so important in the moment of uh, the war with uh, Ukraine. Uh, maybe also why uh, Scholz 
should think right away in France along when he starts initiatives. What would you recommend to improve the situation? Thank you very much. If you just could add who, who you are, sort of. Uh, sorry, I forgot. I'm a former former German diplomat, ambassador in Ukraine and other places, uh, but following uh, France also since uh, the late seventies. Thank you very much. I would suggest we go um, also listen to the other um, uh, persons who still have questions, and when we have a have a round of of the panel, we we'll pick and choose what what they want to respond to. So Felix uh, Wagenitz is next one. Yes, thank you very much. Can can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Uh, thank you. I'm I am a uh, pardon me? Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to just remind you to introduce yourself. Yes. Yes, I'm a political science student um in Freiburg and uh, I'm actually also part of the Generation EU uh, network that um France and Germany have initiated uh, in January this year um for the Elysee Treaty Festival. And we're going to meet um, Macron and Steinmeier next week in Dresden, actually, and talk to them. And I wanted to pose a question to you, uh, Jakob Ross, um, because you said that Germany and France have deep disagreements in the energy sector, particularly on the question of nuclear power. And um, I mean, in relation to climate change and the urgent need to to for a strong german french relationship to tackle this issue i wanted to to ask you um what what other sector do you think that um germany and france should focus on to tackle climate change i mean or or um even in the energy uh, sector are there other issues that can be uh, where there are um points that are they are um agreeing more upon? thank you very much and last but not least uh, leah metka please Hello? Yes, very sorry. Sorry, it took me some time. Um, sorry. Lea Metke, I work for the French Energy uh, Regulatory Commission. So basically, my question was already said by Felix. But yeah, it was on the um, energy policy and our um, emission targets in the EU. So we have two uh, hardliners, let's say. And I think that also is a kind of uh, EU block that is forming. I mean, the nuclear side and the very hard liners on renewables. So how do we think we can cope with this? Because I think there are very, very few um, direct bilateral canals that we can see now. I mean, there's, of course, discussion on the government side, and we have seen some uh, initiatives uh, during the Franco-German summit. But I don't feel that there are concrete next steps. And if I look in the near future, and we talk about maybe hydrogen, we see there's, again, a real um, divergence between France and Germany. So what do you think can be done to, to cope with these uh, two strong lines? And and I go further, I go beyond uh, France and Germany because I think there are really two, two big blocks coming up in uh, emerge in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got uh, five minutes left and, and uh, four questions or, or maybe three. Um, um, sort of what to expect of the um, Macron speech uh, in Dresden, um, sort of um, uh, how are we um, uh, going forward in, in terms of climate change, not only uh, on this bilateral relationship, but, but even beyond that, and uh, what uh, the panel would recommend um, for the Franco-German relationship going forward. Um, who wants to start? Maybe Michaela Wiegel again? So very quickly, um, the Dresden speech. Um, I think there will be some um, answers to the questions that, I, at least I, that's what I expect that we just raised, uh, meaning on um, defense, on uh, European sovereignty, on energy, um, and um, and also on the enlargement questions. And um, it'll be about what the French-German relationship is about. Um, it, do we, are we too, too positive? It's, it's, very, it's very rare that a journalist gets this question because normally we are always criticized for being too critical. So um, I take that as, as, as a compliment. Um, I really think, yes, obviously you can say that there are a lot of things um, that are uh, confrontational in uh, between France and Germany, but um, it's not the first time that times are changing quickly. I mean, we had a huge financial crisis and France and Germany 
were not um, on the same page. Uh, we had the Balkan wars. We, I mean, we had always ha we have always uh, gone through crisis. So I don't think that there's something particularly um, uh, specific about this crisis. And I think we really should note the French shift towards a more Western um, NATO and EU enlargement approach. And I don't see yet um, the German shift for a more European sovereign approach, I see a shift towards um, more a more transatlantic and um, and a pro-American approach. And this is very um, surprising, I must say. And I understand why this um, is debated in France. So I leave it here because we don't have much time left. Thank you very much. Jakob, please. Then just, uh, I absolutely agree with what uh, Michaela Wiegel just said. I think the, the, the French have uh, moved in a way, and now the, the German government uh, should should move uh, in, in the opposite direction to meet them, in, in a sense. Um, on, on the speech in, in Dresden, um, I first of all, I was surprised that President Macron didn't take the opportunity to, to speak in Ludwigsburg, um, to kind of have this, this second big speech uh, um, after the goal did his uh, speech to the German youth that Macron uh, didn't want to to repeat this, but apparently I talked to officials and they said that this seemed too much turned toward the past and and to, could be perceived as anachronistic and that um, both governments wanted to to uh, give a signal towards the future. That's why he he will speak in Dresden after meeting at the Fraunhofer Institute. They will debate cyber questions, artificial intelligence. So it's very much about uh, what can we do going forward. And and also there might be a small signal in that, but that's a lot of interpretation here, that it's uh, in Eastern Germany, you know, looking eastwards, kind of following the debate in a sense geographically. Um, I'm very cu curious personally if there will be some comments in some sense on the recent events, you know, the, the AfD having very strong um, uh, uh, results in, in, in Eastern Germany, uh, at least in the polls, for instance, um, I mean, Macron won't comment on German interior politics, but he might send some kind of signal. So I'm looking out for that. Um, and very briefly on, on energy and climate policy, um, I think it's a, if it's a perfect example that that's a field at the moment where I have trouble seeing the compromise position because the, the stance on nuclear energy is so far apart and not only for next year or in five years, but for the coming 20 or 30 years. And it has huge consequences for where the investments will go in terms of industry that I really don't see at the moment where the compromise will come from. And as you said, Lea, um, you see that these these very different uh, positions are, are, are having a coalition effect that now on the European level, you have the pro-nuclear side and the anti-nuclear side with Germany and France leading one of the camps. And that's a, a huge problem for a common European policy. Just one last sentence, I think that uh, one interesting field where there actually is Franco-German cooperation, to go to uh, your question, Felix, uh, is in city cooperation, where uh, a lot of German and French cities are trying to, to work together on adaptation. How will we cope with temperatures around 40, 45 degrees uh, going forward? What lessons can be learned, say, in Saxony from, I don't know, the Côte d'Azur, what has been done there? So that's a very concrete uh, field of cooperation where I think that many young people want to get involved as well. So it's a good sign. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we have got, got to go, go maybe one minute, 30 seconds for, for, for a final verse from uh, Rolf Nika. Yeah, thank you very much. Just wanted to address what, what uh, Jürgen Heimsel said. What to do better? Uh, I think speak more, uh, consult more, recommit to the French-German uh, uh, reflex. Um, recommit uh, to common to common proposals as much as we can and taking into account the fact that that for example what we see in defense is a, uh, is a very very long standing difference between what are we doing in defense are we can are we doing more on with nato are we doing more within the european union and and that is something that will that will last same thing with uh, with the uh, nuclear energy um, so I would say, let's accept differences uh, when when there where there are differences.
differences and and try to move ahead anyway, because you can move ahead on 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 European uh, issues, on, on, on climate uh, climate change, for example, even defense, even if you have fundamental strategic strategic and long standing differences. So so let's accept differences and let's not over exaggerate them. That would be my recommendation. Thank you very much. And, and with that, um, I, I thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Um, join me and thanking our panelists, Michaela Wiegel, Rolf Nickel, and Jakob Ross. Um, and with that, I wish you a very good day and see you next week. Goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir. A bientôt. Bonne journée à tous. Au revoir.